A very good evening to all on our 16th session of international lecture series. Uh, just few instructions that uh, during the session, do not share your screen as well as please mute from your side so that there is no disruption in the lecture. And if you have any query, you can put your query in the chat box and all the questions will be taken at the last of the session by Patrick, sir. We'll be starting in a few minutes.
a very good evening to all i dr janetha on behalf of sherlock institute of forensic science would like to welcome you all on today's webinar of international lecture series i welcome all the participants as well as patrick sir and thank you so much sir for accepting our invitation it's my pleasure to introduce you to our participants today thank you sir for taking out time from your schedule and accepting our invitation my pleasure uh today we have our speaker patrick randolph quinn is sir he is associate professor forensic and biological anthropology department of applied science and faculty of health and Sci uh, life sciences northumbria university newcastle upon tyne uk dr patrick randolph quinn is a forensic and biological anthropologist he is associate professor of forensic science at northumbria university where he leads the forensic unit science unit his broad interest concern the application of multidisciplinary forensic taphonomy into both current medical legal practice and the evolutionary anthropology of the deep past he has extensive casework experience in both forensic anthropology and archaeology in the uk and sub saharan africa including archaeology of fatal fires and as a member of mission chambers africans extraordinaries investigating human rights abuses in the republic of cag he was coordinator of the african school for the forensic science and human rights in conjunction with the argentine forensic team which is eaaf he has ex he has research interest in osseous taphonomy particularly differentiation of subaerial and subsurface processes trauma analysis agnotrisis and application of digital methods in the analysis of spatial taphonomy and the decomposition process and today he is going to give lecture on the impact of forensic human taphonomy from body farms to the court room with this i would like to request patrick sir to take over the session Okay. The screen is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Share screen. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I know there are people from all over um, both hemispheres uh, and a few familiar faces in the audience. So welcome to uh, today's talk and thank you very much uh, for the Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, something that's very dear to my own heart, which is uh, forensic taphonomy, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, but others may not. Um, and this is a relatively new um, uh, inclusion into the, the range of applied sciences uh, that we think of as forensic science. Um, but it's been referred to by Dennis Dirkmat as probably, certainly within my own field of forensic anthropology, uh, the most important development within that field in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, and it has the potential for um, immense impact in how we conduct uh, forensic science, but more importantly, how we deal with um, uh, corporal remains. So we deal with the, the remains um, of deceased individuals. So um, I need to give you a little bit of a warning. Um, there are images of decomposed human and animal remains in this presentation. Uh, some of them are uh, by necessity quite unpleasant. Um, and it's one of these things, those of us who deal with, with particularly things like violent death. Death is an, an, an unfortunate um, and natural part of life. And um, that's part of um, a forensic science. So without further ado, we'll start off with the basics. Um, so what is taphonomy? Uh, well, taphonomy itself comes from uh, the disciplines of paleontology and uh, geology. It is uh, a binomial word um, split up into two Greek parts, taphos and nomos. And it was first coined by the Russian paleontologist Efremov in 1940. Um, and uh, its literal translation from the Russian is the study of the transition in all its details of animal remains from the biosphere to the lithosphere. So originally when it was formulated, it was, it was effectively trying to figure out how the fossil record came about. Um, so the, the, the bones of dinosaurs and other animals, um, fish, um, Efremov was actually writing about, um, about gastropods and about um, snails. 
um, and invertebrates, but in the, over the, the course of about um, uh, 15, 20 years, it became adopted into uh, the wider field of geology and particularly into vertebrate uh, paleontology. So the illustration you've got here is of a dead dinosaur um, and uh, that's the, the animal when it's, it's just met its fate. And taphonomy is the study of how those bones go uh, from being um, a living, breathing organism to um, uh, skeletonizing, to preserving, potentially preserving, right through to recovery. And you can see a paleontologist here about to pull a chunk of femur out of a section. Um, and the, the, the discipline set out to construct the laws of burial. So taphonomy is very often called the law of burial, although it's much, much bigger than that. And you're going to see in a few moments. Um, it's about the process called embedding, and that's what, what um, Evramov talked about. So essentially how we go from um, living organisms to becoming part of the geological past and present. And it deals with information loss. So what information has been lost through the loss of soft tissues, um, through uh, the loss of bones, uh, right through to information gain. So what, what can we still, what um, can we tell from the things that preserve? Um, and what biases operate on uh, the formation of these assemblages, but also how we actually go about uh, recovering them um, ourselves. So what are the biases that we as archaeologists or paleontologists, forensic scientists introduce into the process? So this is, this is the, 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 the central tenets of this were set up in terms of geology. Um, it falls under a, a category of investigation called uniformitarianism, which we'll come on to in a moment. And it has kind of two streams. It has a classical stream, um, which comes from the paleosciences, which is, is primarily inductive in terms of how its logic works. And it has a, a neo taphonomy or actualistic stream, which is much more uh, in a way scientific in the fact that it's based on the hypothetical deductive method. And these days there are uh, subdivisions, there are sub branches of taphonomy. And one of the most important ones, um, speaking from my perspective, and those of us who work in anthropology and archaeology um, in forensic science is the application to the forensic sciences, um, to death assemblages and what they can tell us. So here we're looking at um, a, a mass grave. Uh, this is a human rights case. And so the taphonomic information uh, deals with not just the, the nature of the skeleton, what, what preserves, but it's the position of the bones. So what they tell us about how those individuals died, evidence of things like trauma, uh, the preservation of clothing, other trace evidence, um, uh, machine cuts. So this was a grave that was dug by uh, a mechanical excavator. And you can see here, um, there are trace evidence marks of that. So it's the whole ecology of the burial environment. And that's what taphonomy in a forensic sense is all about. Um, so there are two kind of approaches to how we do taphonomy. So um, when, when I trained initially as a, an archeologist, um, I was trained in, in the classical approaches, which are inductive. Um, and inductivism basically means you look at things, you get an idea for how they might have formed. It's a narrative approach. Um, and taphonomy uses spatial patterning, so the relationship between bones um, and the bits of the skeleton or bits of, of a body that are left to develop a logical narrative. So it's, it's about um, pattern and process. So for instance, here, this is a, an archeological case, but it could easily be forensic. Um, so, uh, Classic taphonomy looks at this preservation of, of this individual here, how the bones um, have moved um, of the, the fingers and of, the, um, of the, the wrists of the feet, the presence of um, fetal remains in the abdominal cavity and um, outside the body um, to reconstruct a narrative. In this case here, it's a situation of what we refer to as, as coffin birth. Um, so post-mortem evulsion of the remains of a, a fetus or an infant um, from a pregnant mother um, after death. But that's all inferred from the relationships within this context. Whereas forensic taphonomy, particularly um, the um, uh, more recent approaches to it in um, experimental terms, comes from a deductive basis. So we, we induce theory or do induce ideas, and then we develop experiments to produce analogues which allow us to test the forensic record or the archaeological record and allows us to falsify what's going on. So actualism is basically um, a process of doing things. So if we want to understand the taphonomy, taphonomic signatures of burning, we set fire to bodies. If you want to understand the taphonomic signatures 
of things like gunshot wounds um, or of burial um, or of excarnation, so exposure of the body after death. We do those things. And this forms the whole basis of what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Um, historically, as I say, taphonomy has come out of uh, geology and there are three major kind of um, uh, movements which took place from the 1940s through to the 1990s. And all of those in a way influence how forensic science adopted the discipline. So in the first instance, you've got um, uh, the initial work of people like um, Efremov, uh, Raymond Dart, um, Alan Hughes and others. And they um, were very often concerned with things like um, grand narratives. So how the fossil record arose, looking at the, the, the famous um, predatory Australopithecine from Makapanskad in South Africa, osteodontocratic culture. Um, those of you who've seen 2001, A Space Odyssey, um, the, the first 15 to 20 minutes are all about that. Um, in the 1960s, 1970s, archaeology discovered um, uh, taphonomy. So people like Bob Brain, Lewis Binford, uh, Diane Gifford, um, and Gifford Gonzalez looked at how archaeological sites formed. Um, and they incorporated things like ethnographic modeling or using animal analogs to look at how uh, fossil assemblages and archaeological assemblages built up. So um, uh, experimental work looking at um, how hyenas um, and leopards accumulated bone in deposits, um, or um, looking at uh, things like Neanderthal cave sites from the point of view of understanding how people like the San, uh, the Hadza and the Inuit um, uh, process carcasses, how they hunt, how they butcher and what they do with their food remains. Um, and then in the 1980s, 1990s, um, you have much more kind of synthetic approaches, particularly geared around human origins. So looking at things like um, formation of bone tools, cut marks, meat eating, what they said about paleoecology and human origins, um, fluvial transport, so the, the movement of carcasses and bodies in a landscape being taken around by water, um, the role of things like um, uh, advanced hunting practices, um, fat consumption, um, and you know what things um, uh, in a much more uh, restricted way do to smaller carcasses. So Peter Andrews worked, for instance, on the, the role of, of owls as accumulating agents. So this became very much more in, interested in the ecology of post-mortem processes and how um, as archeologists or as geologists, paleontologists, information then would come down um, for analysis. And then in the kind of the, well, it started in the 1970s, but really in the 1990s, um, following these, these three uh, major shifts um, in the development of taphonomy, um, forensic science gets in on the act. And there are two um, core uh, volumes which are uh, play a big, big part in this. Um, they are um, Forensic Taphonomy, Postmortem Fate of Human Remains, edited by Bill ha uh, Hagland and Marcella Sorg, published in 1997, and then Advances in Forensic Taphonomy, um, published in 2002. And those are the two seminal textbooks. Um, they are edited volumes uh, of research papers which set the framework for how forensic taphonomy then develops as a discipline. Um, and forensic taphonomy differs from conventional taphonomy in the sense that it has a um, different set of questions. So it's very often, um, it uses actualism. So very often it's, it's geared around forensic observation, but it's also geared around experimentation to answer forensically relevant questions. So uh, for instance, time since death, the nature of human intervention, so what's the living do to the dead, um, and influences uh, greatly um, preservational bias in terms of things like search strategies. So it influences how we might go looking for bodies, uh, we, we might um, uh, be looking for chemical signatures or the physical signatures, and how we then recover those remains to maximize forensically relevant information. And it differs from all other areas of taphonomy through um, three principal factors. The first one is it has something called a lack of time averaging. So we are tend to be dealing with a very short period of time. It's a single event that maybe it lasted only a few moments, the, 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 um, the death of an individual. So cessation of life um, through homicide. Um, and we may be recovering that, that, that individual or those remains within a few hours, a few days, a few weeks or months or years since their death. And that's very different from the, the extended timescale under which archaeology and paleontology works. And it tends to deal with individuals. So the individual is the unit of analysis. So even in situations where you maybe have a mass disaster, 
you're still only dealing with quite a small number of individuals, um, uh, usually one, two or three. Um, and that's quite different from these big time average assemblies we see in the geological record. But more importantly, um, the interpretations may be ground truthed. So we can actually ask eyewitnesses um, as best as their, as their memory um, can assist or perpetrators of crimes, whether or not our interpretations are correct or not. Um, and they can be tested fundamentally and um, finally in a court of law. Um, and some notion of truth um, can then be um, uh, taken from that. So forensic taphonomy is very, very different from conventional taphonomy in that regard. Um, and so, but it, you know, why did it take so long for, these, for forensic science to pick up on these, these issues? Um, and really it started in the 1970s um, with a chap called William Bass or Bill Bass um, from the University of Tennessee. Um, and him and his colleagues were um, uh, part of the kind of nascent field of forensic anthropology. And they were brought uh, remains of individuals who had been uh, recovered from um, uh, accidental contact. So burials in farmer's fields um, or on agricultural land. When law enforcement brought these bodies to, um, to Bill and his colleagues, they were in a remarkably good state of preservation. And um, one of the obvious things that we, we were asked when remains are provided to us is, are these of forensic relevance? And these remains were in very good condition. There was soft tissue associated with them. And um, uh, Bass and his colleagues were convinced uh, wrongly at the time that these were of forensic relevance. And it turns out they were actually individuals um, who were embalmed uh, fatalities from the American Civil War. And there's a, there's a, a, an image here, uh, which is taken from um, uh, uh, Bob, uh, uh, Robert Mann's and Bill Bass's 1990 paper, um, dealing with time since death and decomposition. Um, so the use of things like arsenic and mercury and other um, extremely poisonous um, uh, agents for whole body embalming essentially meant that these remains did not decompose normally, and therefore the post-mortem interval estimation that Bass came up with was wrong. Um, but in turning to the literature, he found out that the, really there wasn't a literature to support these kind of um, interpretations or this type of analysis. So um, they set about uh, at Tennessee um, effectively developing or inventing the science of forensic taphonomy. Um, and this paper here, uh, published in 1990, was based on almost 20 years of uh, data, uh, both from the facility itself, but also from uh, coroners and other uh, medical legal examiners, and it was basically looking at what factors may affect the, the decay rate of a body. Um, and this is published in 1990, and this all, as we're going to see later on, makes fairly logical sense. Um, but uh, this was based on almost no hard science. This was anecdotal uh, data or, or assertions. Um, the, the, the real hard science in forensic taphonomy hadn't really kicked in yet. Um, and that science has largely come out of something we refer to as taphonomic research facilities. Uh, colloquially, they're referred to as body farms. I'm sure most of you will have come across the term. Uh, body farm itself um, was uh, a term um, uh, first coined by Patricia Cornwall, um, the, uh, the novelist. Um, and it was basically based on, uh, her research was based on, um, for this book was based on the work of Bill Bass, and that's Bill um, seen here, um, who in 1971 set up um, the, uh, the Tennessee, um, uh, University of Tennessee Forensic Anthropology Facility, okay, otherwise known as a uh, taphonomic research facility. And this is a human-based facility that takes um, donor bodies, uh, starts out as a fairly small area uh, with, one, with one body, and its aim was to understand the natural process of decomposition. So what it happens after death to a body in a scientific controlled way. And now it's, um, it's a three acre complex that houses around 40 individuals at any one time. Um, it used unclaimed bodies initially for medical examiners, but now it's um, largely through a process of informed consent. And this really set the scene for the development of other human taphonomic facilities around the world. So there are multiple TRF as we refer to them in the US. Um, there are facilities now in Europe, Australasia, and there are non-human based facilities uh, in different parts of the world as well. So using animal analogs. Um, my previous institution, University of Central Lancashire, has Europe's largest one. There's facilities in Cape Town um, and in various other institutions um, in the UK. And those are using animal analogues um, uh, as a counterpoint to um, human decomposition studies. 
Um, but each of the ones that are found outside of Tennessee pursue their own range of research. Um, Tennessee itself deals with buried remains, unburied, um, water-based um, uh, deposition, um, uh, decomposition in structures. You've got places like Western Carolina that focus on things like mountain region decomposition. Um, the Sydney facility provides um, information on arid um, southern hemisphere data. So each of these effectively has uh, a different flavor, as you, uh, if you want to think of it, um, uh, caused by the local topography, um, altitude, soils, weather, etc. But the whole idea behind the use of TRX um, is to elucidate um, valuable forensic questions. Principal ones of which is to understand hum human decomposition. So what's the process following death? Um, and very often they are expressly geared towards uh, the formulation of accurate and precise models of post-mortem interval estimation or PMI. Um, they uh, uh, ask questions such as how fast does the body become skeletonized? So what's the process from um, the, the pattern and process of uh, loss of the soft tissues and the organs through skeletonization? But they also fulfill a, a major function in terms of training law enforcement officers. So um, search and rescue teams, cadaver dogs, um, and the development of uh, search strategies and search equipment to allow um, for uh, buried or disrupted remains in the environment to be recovered. Um, they, uh, there's a lot of work that's been, been taking place at a number of facilities looking at the analysis of volatile organic compounds or VOCs. And this is what we'll come on to later on effectively is the smell of death. Um, is here you're seeing um, Maurice Alders and um, uh, Rolf Jan Oostra of the Arista facility in, um, in Amsterdam, which basically has real-time monitoring of the, some of the chemical uh, compounds that are released both um, uh, into the ground and into the air as bodies decompose. One of the world's leading experts, this is Professor Shari Forbes of the University of Three Rivers in Quebec, um, uh, one of the world's leading experts in the analysis of volatiles, lipids, biomarkers, um, and she's just started the new, the first facility of its kind in Canada um, at, um, at uh, Quebec. Um, other facilities focus on things like targeted geophysics, so looking at how a body decomposes, how that changes things like the profile of ground penetrating radar, uh, the effects of where bodies are buried in relation to things like tree line, um, root structures, different soil profiles, um, and how that affects our ability to detect bodies, not just for, for years, but for decades, um, uh, and test those against things like the reliability of cadaver dogs. So the error rate evaluation in, um, in uh, using dogs to detect remains. So these are, these are really valid, very, very uh, significant um, areas of interest. But forensic taphonomy goes much uh, wider than just uh, the interpretation of on-site evidence, so forensic recovery from, um, uh, from uh, crime scenes, and actually encompasses many, many other areas of research. So this is a, um, uh, a bibliographic matrix of um, the last 20 years of um, uh, publications in taphonomy or forensic taphonomy. And it gives you an idea, the bigger the words, um, uh, it gives you an idea of, of um, what the most important subject areas are. So where more publications um, take place, uh, and it gives you an idea of, of potentially some of the different areas in which forensic taphonomy operates. So um, we can see some of the um, some of the words here: forensic entomology, post-mortem interval estimation, accumulated decree days, forensic pathology, histology, DNA, uh, forensic medicine, archaeology, identification, mass graves, forensic archaeology, radar, geophysics, volatile organic compounds, um, trauma, post-mortem, perimortem. All these different areas are tied together under the subject of taphonomy. So it's an enormous discipline um, and we are only touching on a very small portion of it today. Um, when you take that data and break it down, taphonomy falls into three main focuses. It, um, it falls under PMI, disposition and intervention. And when you look at those in a bit more detail, PMI is the study of decomposition stages, the role of insects, diagenesis and decomposition chemistry. So, that, so changing chemical environments in the post-mortem period. Disposition deals with body disposal, so what humans do to dispose of bodies. Um, biotic and abiotic effects, so biological and non-biological processes in the environment that lead to preservation or destruction of remains. It deals with the burial environments themselves, it deals with things like predation and scavenging. And then finally, and this is it, we won't get time to talk about much today, 
is the role of human agency. So it's looking at perimortem trauma, surface modifications. So things like dismemberment, gunshot wounds, burning, explosive damage, cut marks, hacking, all those areas fall under the remit of taphonomy. So it's a huge, huge subject area. Um, and really uh, today I'm gonna to be primarily focusing on um, postmodern mental estimation and um, the disposition of bodies. So what happens after death? Um, and this is something that all of us at some stage in our lives, well, at the end of it, will encounter. Uh, we will ultimately die. And once uh, there is a cessation of life, um, then bodies pass through um, a series of stages marked by uh, different chemical, biochemical, physical, bacterial, fungal processes, etc. cetera. Um, and these are the, are the, are the basic um, stages. Um, bodies go from being fresh which in the case of forensic science, um, estimating a post-mortem interval estimation is based on the classic Morton triad. So forensic pathologists looking at alga, liver, and rigor mortis. Um, so looking at, at um, uh, blood settling in the body, looking at temperature and looking at rigidity of, uh, and um, flexibility of muscles. Um, and that usually covers the first um, 48 to 72 hours after death. And then following that body goes through putrefaction um, which is, has an early component to it, a later component, and then fermentation, and then follow finally by dry decay or skeletonization. And that process can take a very long period of time, or it can take a short period of time, depending on the environmental variables. Um, but immediately following death, the body starts to go through two primary um, uh, sets of processes. The most important, which is a process called autolysis or self-destruction, okay, autolytic decomposition. And then later on, that's followed by putrefaction and full decomposition. Um, autolysis itself is pre-programmed cell death, and essentially it's caused by a lack of oxygen uh, and it occurs in the most metabolically active cells in the body. Um, they, you get a breakdown um, of uh, or a lack of transfer of um, uh, processes inside and outside of the cell through the cell membrane. There is a lack of cell signaling um, and uh, the cells uh, cells themselves uh, basically um, die and begin to break down in a pre-programmed fashion. Um, it causes a bit of a... Okay, if, yeah. You could, whoever that is, could you mute your screen or mute your, um, uh, your microphone, please, thank you. Um, it causes a bit of carbon monoxide uh, and waste products um, to build up inside of cells and increase in cell pH. And then enzymes and cells attack the cell walls, which causes them to break down further. And then you get this nutrient rich fluids being surrounded into uh, released into the surrounding tissues, which initiates then the process of putrefaction. Uh, and putrefaction is primarily, it goes in two parts. It's driven by bacteria in the main. So it's, uh, it's bacterially uh, mediated. Um, putrefaction is driven by anaerobic bacteria. So that's a bacteria that do not require the presence of oxygen. Um, and that causes soft tissues to break down. So effectively they're, they're, they are eaten and it releases gases, liquids um, and various salts into the bodies, uh, volatile and um, uh, labile compounds. And that can involve um, fungi and protozoa as well as uh, anaerobic bacteria. Principal um, site for anaerobic bacteria is primarily comes from the gut um, in terms of initiating putrefaction. So, um, your good and bad bacteria that, that are part of the gastrointestinal tract are the prime initiators in this process. And then uh, as decomposition continues or as putrefaction continues, decomposition then takes, it, takes place where you have aerobic bacteria, uh, which are brought in primarily from the surrounding environment, skin and other parts of the, um, of the um, immediate vicinity of a cadaver, and they work alongside anaerobic activity to um, complete uh, decomposition. And it occurs in a relatively well understood order. Uh, the order starts off with the intestine, stomach, organs, digestion, heart and the blood, then passes into the air filled structures such as the, um, the lungs, then into the, the structures of the viscera um, and of the um, abdominal cavity, so kidneys, bladder, eventually reaching the brain, nervous tissues, skeletal muscle, connective tissue and integument, so the skin eventually, um, ligaments and tendons, and then finally the bones. And that takes anywhere, uh, these different stages, are, these are very, very uh, broad um, timeframes here, anywhere up to about 50 days for dry remains or 200 days, depending on, on other survival factors. Or in some instances, 
we get to a certain point in the decay cycle, um, in active decay, um, and there is a cessation of uh, decomposition. So it's, it's arrested for some reason. We'll talk about that, some of those issues later on. Bodies can survive um, looking remarkably fresh for very long periods of time, depending on the environment. So these are, these are very much um, uh, broad uh, brushstrokes based on normal decomposition processes. Um, and the body itself goes through a whole series of different physical manifestations of this decay. So one of the most obvious one is um, within a first um, few days of decomposition is skin slippage. And this is caused by hydrolytic enzymes at the, the dermal epithe um, epidermal junction. So between the dermis and the epidermis, um, uh, decay, active decay processes take place and that causes a variety of different manifestations. Um, uh, effectively skin peeling, you can get edema, buildup of, um, of uh, fluids um, and blistering taking place. And it's just the, um, the, the surface tissues, the, the, the first few um, uh, millimeters, um, some cases microns of surface tissue, which are lost. So things like which go into the deeper into the dermis, such as tattoos are not lost. Um, but this can create problems for things like um, fingerprinting. So the loss, losing the dermis may well reduce down the efficacy of being able to get good latent prints out. Um, uh, and it can create um, a false impression of um, things like surface trauma on a body. As decomposition continues further, then we get the process of marbling, which is called by autolysis of uh, blood cells, particularly in the larger vessels. So um, not just the peripheral um, uh, arterial and venous supply, but, but the, the large veins and arteries, um, uh, which are found underneath the skin. And um, as oxygen itself is lost from hemoglobin, um, it turns the, um, uh, the blood a, a purple or blue color. Um, and eventually, as we'll see later on, there are, there are other colors that are involved in decomposition, and that's caused by um, sulfur compounds. And basically what you produce then are this kind of arborescent effect, uh, which maps out the, the vein pattern, um, the arterial pattern under the skin, um, and it causes these areas of staining um, uh, in conjunction with the other process going on at the same time as well. And then as anaerobic bacterial um, action builds up, um, particularly the growth of bacteria, there's nothing to, to moderate them or mediate their, their growth. Um, they produce large amounts of decomposition gases um, and that leads to bloating um, within, particularly within the abdominal cavity and that leads to, to swelling, um, uh, not just of the gastrointestinal tract, but those areas which are uh, associated with it. So that can be um, around the genitals, it could be the fascial compartments of the upper and lower limb and that causes the body to bloat and swell and eventually um, the skin can either split um, or the body itself can purge and decomposition products are lost. So um, this is what we call purge fluid which is expelled from various orifices so usually um, the nasal aperture, the mouth but it can also be the, um, the anus as well um, or through skin splittage um, so in which case it's just um, expelled under pressure. And that then goes into the environment um, and soaks into um, uh, surrounding uh, things like fabrics, um, the soil, um, uh, or if the body is buried and these processes are taking place underground, then these, these, um, these purge tissues are then lost or soak into the um, surrounding soil matrix. Um, we get discoloration, and, and these are caused by sulfur-based compounds which react with hemoglobin and myoglobin. Um, uh, and they create this green appearance as well. So this goes in conjunction with, um, with skin marbling. And it's initially localized where the intestines are in contact with the abdominal wall, but progresses quite rapidly out of those areas. So all these processes are going on concomitantly. At the same time, and those of you who have experienced um, uh, not just human bodies, but um, decomposing animal remains, will realize that there is a particular um, sweet sickly scent to, uh, to death. Um, and the odor is extremely strong. And those are a complex mix of volatile compounds or VOCs, which produce during decomposition. And it includes various classes of, um, of chemicals, acids, alcohols, aldehydes, um, uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, ketones, sulfides, in a very complex mixture. Um, and this is what we call the scent of death. And um, uh, historically, um, this is something that um, we've been interested in as ways of developing electronic noses, but also of um, training cadaver dogs um, who are capable uh, potentially um, of um, finding um, buried remains, uh, human and animal, based on uh, particularly the presence of two um, amines, putrescine and cadaverine, 
uh, which are thought um, to persist for only a short period of time um, within um, in the, the post-mortem period, but which um, these animals can pick up not just on land, but in water as well. But we now know that it's a much more complex picture of interaction between volatile um, organics. Um, and it's likely that in some shape or form, the Putrescina cadaveri themselves persist for a very long period of time as well. Um, they just derivativize or change their chemical structures as time goes on. Um, so um, odor can be used to detect bodies, but odor is also a fundamental part in uh, the predation cycle um, of particular things like insects, how they detect and how they then move in to, to colonize um, cadavers. So basically what we get are five recognizable stages. I'm using a, um, photographs here of pigs taken from experimental work at um, the University of Central Lancashire. And so um, this is uh, taking place outdoors. And it's important to note that this is um, outdoors with insect access. This is very important. So um, initially body appears fresh. Um, it goes through the, the, the mortis triad. Um, and it has the capacity for OB position also for insects to visit the body and to deposit their eggs. And we'll talk a bit more about entomology later. And this is very important to realize is that depending where a body is, if it's in an open air, if it's in a closed structure or it's in a burial environment, decomposition will, uh, will approach in a different way. This is from Alison Galloway's work in 1997. Um, uh, and that was um, collated from a series of forensic cases in Arizona. And you can see there's a very clear difference between open air decomposition and closed structure decomposition. And very often that has to do with the access to insects to the remains. Um, so um, following the initial stage, we move into uh, bloating. So distension, marbling, purging, skin slippage, um, an accumulation of, of gases in the abdomen um, and clear visible markers on the surface of the body. As we progress through active decay, we get maggot activity. Um, we get um, collapse of, of body structures and a very strong odor. And you'll see here these kind of granular uh, patterns. This is, this is a very, very large series of maggot masses. And this staining um, area around the body is the migration of um, volatile and particularly uh, labile compounds. Um, uh, uh, so liquids that are purged during decomposition moving out into the environment. And it's characterized by great loss of body mass, um, large maggot masses and liquefaction. And that's what you're seeing there. And then we have advanced decay where you end, may end up with um, just the skeleton and a bit of preserved integument surviving. And what tissues are left are very soft, um, easily destroyed um, and putty-like in terms of their consistency. Um, and insects at this point will have moved on because um, there's nothing for the, um, the maggots to feed on as we'll see in a moment. And um, the vegetation in the area around a, a, a body may well start to die um, caused by the buildup of uh, toxic elements um, in the decomposition products. Eventually that will return, but there has been an alteration to the surrounding environment. And then finally, we're left with the skeleton, but with some potential, some areas of um, uh, markers that were where a body once was in terms of vegetation um, and chemical signatures. Then eventually we lose the connective tissue, we may get disarticulation um, and then eventual regrowth and potentially soil formations, that body then gets incorporated um, into Ephraimov's lithosphere, so it becomes part of the ground. And the various things that affect um, decomposition, uh, the two most important ones, two general areas, is co-linking of temperature and humidity and the type of deposit. So whether it's um, a body that's on a, a grassy surface, whether it's a body that has um, been buried in concrete, whether it's in a clandestine grave, a shallow grave, a deep grave, um, or lying on a mattress in a, in a house. That is the deposit and that greatly influences um, uh, how that body will then will decompose and what then is left to us as forensic scientists. Um, but the two critical things um, in the first instance that, that um, uh, affect both the pattern and tempo of decomposition is temperature and humidity. Temperature and humidity um, uh, influence two things. One is insect activity. So we'll see in a moment that insects are the principal drivers of decomposition in the body, um, and it's a form of predation. And um, insect activity and their life cycle is dependent both on temperature and humidity. But um, uh, temperature also influences the rate um, uh, of speed, either speeding up or slowing down of chemical processes. So effectively, the, the um, uh, for every 10 degrees rise in temperature or 10 degrees fall in temperature, 
um, you either double the rate of a chemical reaction or half it, and that has big plays a big bearing on um, non-insect moderated effects, um, uh, particularly things like autolysis. Um, so uh, temperature is a big uh, plays a big part in this, and also humidity as well. So very dry environments can lead to mummification or the drying effect of the desiccation of the body quite rapidly. But as I say, also that the type of deposit is important as well. So burial itself slows down decomposition and restricts access to carnivores and insects, um, even quite shallow burials. Um, it also reduces the access of oxygen. So um, uh, anaerobic bacteria will play a much greater part in that. Aerobic bacteria um, are very often shut out because there is, there is a very little oxygen getting to the body itself. Um, but depending on the number of individuals buried, if it's a single grave, um, it develops in a, um, a relatively well understood progressive way, but large um, concentrations of, of individuals, mass graves, mass fatality burials, may well have very, very different patterns of, of decomposition and survival, depending whether you're in the center of the grave or at the periphery. And um, we really don't quite understand um, precisely how that works at this point. Water also plays an important part. Um, it can shut out um, it can shut out access to oxygen, so waterlogged deposits, but also salinity. So if it's, if it's um, salty, either through um, sodium chloride, um, um, seawater, um, but other also um, other um, chemical salts can retard decomposition. And if a body is wrapped, if it's got wearing clothing or it's wrapped up in uh, carpeting or in plastic, that's also important in, in, in affecting the decomposition. Um, but the principal one, that drives decomposition is the action of insects. And insects are attracted, they are evolutionarily um, predisposed to come to a body. Um, they are particularly things like blowflies, so um, Calephridae, they're attracted to their body very quickly, sometimes within minutes, and they can travel from kilometers away to the complex volatile organic um, plume that's being given off um, by the early stages of decomposition. Um, and um, what they do is they, they arrive at, a, at the body, they deposit, um, so females will begin to deposit eggs um, on that body, those eggs will then hatch, become maggots, and maggots have jaws, they have effectively have teeth, um, they have dental sclera, and they can actually eat tissues. So what you're seeing um, here, uh, so we've got some beetles in the center here, but the rest of these are um, displaying maggot masses, is that maggots are capable of reducing bodies to um, to skeleton uh, quite rapidly um, if they can get access through the skin and um, through things like um, um, uh, skin splittage or wounds, etc., or around the, the orifices, um, they can reduce the body to, um, to skeleton quite rapidly. And it's part of a, a, a cycle that we refer to as um, uh, the hollow metabolis, uh, metabolist development of, um, of, in this case, flies. Adults, females lay eggs, those eggs hatch, they become maggots, they become, enter then through the larval stage, they then become adult flies and the cycle repeats itself. And this can take place through many series of cycles on the same cadaver uh, before eventually there is nothing left for the maggots to eat. Um, and this is high dependent on temperature. We use this as a form of post-mortem interval estimation. So um, uh, this is take, these um, data are taken from um, standard textbooks on forensic entomology, um, but, um, Bird and Kastner. And you can see here that uh, it's the um, time between uh, for, a, for an egg to hatch is highly dependent on temperature. So at 16 degrees centigrade, it takes 49 hours to hatch. At 35 degrees centigrade, it takes only eight hours to hatch once it's been laid. Um, pupation varies between uh, low temperatures and high temperatures and uh, the, uh, occurs much more rapidly as the temperature increases. And then how long it takes for the adult fly to emerge um, is, um, is moderated by temperature as well. And so the way that we deal with this in terms of understanding the, the life cycle of, of flies is to um, uh, collect maggots from a body. And uh, we can tell uh, the age of a maggot affected the developmental stage of a, a maggot by looking at um, what are called the posterior spiracles. Um, and these refer to the, or that allow us to look at what's called the instar stages of the fly. So if you look at them under a microscope, these are basically the breathing um, spiracles of a fly its mouth parts are buried in the um, um, in tissue, uh, so effectively they're breathing through their backside. And um, the whether or not these have one, two, or three slits uh, will allow us to assess the developmental stage of the uh, the maggot. And we can also effectively then um, collect and um, uh, look at uh, larvae as well. 
And so what we're doing um, effectively here is um, an entomologist or forensic entomologist can uh, assess the, the various life stages of um, insects. Um, insects can be collected and bred in a laboratory to understand um, how individual and genetic variation influences this. Um, and this will allow for the, um, the, um, the validation of the life stages of the flies against temperature. And we use, or entomologists use two different areas in this. So one that's called accumulated degree hours um, and ultimately accumulated degree days. And that effectively is a uh, summation of the total temperature range during the life cycle of those insects from first deposition through to collection. And that gives us an idea quite accurately of um, the potential post-mortem interval if we know what the temperature um, uh, that a body has gone through environmentally through from death to the, um, the collection of the remains of those insects. And in um, uh, 2005, um, again, coming out of um, University of Tennessee, McGazy, Rocky and, and Haskell uh, used the entomological approach to combine um, uh, un an understanding of temperature with the understanding of the decomposition stage of a body to construct a post-mortem interval um, estimation equation, which is based on this, this process of accumulated degree days. Um, and it works relatively well. Um, it has efficacy in the early stages of um, decomposition, less efficacy as we move towards skeletonization. But basically, it works on the process of assessing body scoring, so assessing the, the uh, extent of marbling, um, slippage, bloating, etc., for the head, the torso, and the limbs, uh, calculating what we call a, a body score on the basis of that, and then working backwards from temperature records to calculate um, how long it would have taken to reach that particular stage of decomposition. But this is effectively predicated on normal decomposition, so that, that it involves insects. There are other um, uh, PMI estimation methods when insects have been excluded. But this gives us a fairly good estimation, um, certainly beyond the mortem triad, for the assessment of PMI. Um, what I want to talk to the, kind of the, 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 the remaining part of this is moving beyond PMI into what the taphonomic process can tell us, then particularly about skeletonization, but also about the, the nature of the burial process um, and um, biases inherent uh, on our recovery of human remains. Now you've seen this, this illustration before. This is a mass grave here and um, skeletonized remains, um, no surviving tissue, um, are relatively stable in terms of their, their chemistry. Um, but tell us an incredible amount about um, the processes um, that have gone on from cessation of life through to, um, to recovery. Um, and it's probably the, more, uh, the much more complex area to follow me rather than that that's looking at PMI estimation. Um, so bone itself, for those of you who are anthropologists, um, apologize, I apologize for um, uh, having to explain this for you, those of you who are not. Uh, bone itself isn't dry, bone is a breathing, living, dynamic system. Um, uh, our skeletons are comprised of both an organic and an inorganic component. Um, we have a bone mineral called bioappetite, or hydroxyapatite, which provides rigidity. And then we have a variety of um, organic components in bone, um, primarily collagen, which provides flexibility and um, uh, allows for the dissipation of force during normal function of, um, of a bone and of a body. Um, there are also other compounds in there, glycines glycin and water and various other things. And we often refer to bone as a triphasic structure. So it's got a mineral component, a soft tissue component or a, or a um, 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 organic component and a water-based component. Um, and it's the interplay between those three parts um, following death that allows us to say some very quite profound taphonomic things about um, what's happened to that, um, that skeleton in order to reach its final skeletonization process. Um, so bone itself, uh, during life, we get um, uh, collagen and bone mineral offer protection to each other. Mechanically, following um, uh, death, they also pr uh, provide a preservation potential alongside each other to preserve um, the quality and structure of the bone for quite some considerable period of time. So a bone um, that's, that's, um, that has been um, uh, recovered and macerated um, so that soft tissue has been removed 
will still feel greasy, it can still feel quite wet, um, and it will largely um, uh, be relatively stable for a long period of time. If, however, um, it's an environment where you begin to separate out the relationship between the collagen, the bioappetite and the water, then bone itself becomes um, quite mechanically friable, it becomes brittle, and it begins to degrade, so it begins to decompose in and of itself. And that's a process we refer to as diagenesis, so it's the post-mortem alterations in physical, chemical and microstructural uh, composition of bone following deposition. And there are three parts to this, whether it occurs under the ground, whether it occurs above ground, and the involvement of time in all of this. Um, and time's the important thing, because very often what we're doing in terms of forensic um, science is, particularly as anthropologists, we're interested in, um, did, did certain processes take place before death, around the time of death, or long after death? Um, so in trauma analysis, for instance, we're interested in things like uh, the presence of things like uh, bone calluses, which give you a clear indication that damage to the skeleton or damage to the body took place during life because it was healing took place. But the taphonomic analysis really takes place after death. And it's this very fine um, line between what's perimortem, so what took place around the time of death, and it could actually be implicated in the cause of death, and what took place long after death. So an instance you're looking at here is bone damage, um, perimortem, this could have taken place um, uh, at the time of the individual's death, or it could have took place within a few weeks, because the bone itself still re responds in a similar way to how it would have responded in, in life. So it fractures in a particular way, it leaves particular patterns of damage. And that's quite different as bone dries out and it loses its competency from what we see in the post-mortem period, um, where the bone um, has basically lost most of its organic component. And what you've got then left then is the minerals that are left inside the bone. And that breaks and fractures in a very different way. And it's that, that's, that those stages of timing which are very important to us. Um, and because what we're looking at is time, oxygen, bacteria, fungi, and the depositional environment, the burial environment. And that's something we refer to in a way as the cadaveric island. So we, we see um, bodies in relation to, to where they are ultimately deposited as an ecological process. And that's very, very highly affected by things like soil type, the pH of the soil, whether it's acidic or alkali, how deep a body is buried, um, how much water there is, whether it's wrapped, um, what's been done to the body. So has it been embalmed um, or treated another way and scavengers get access to it. And it's an incredibly complex process, um, which um, there are entire textbooks devoted to. So we're gonna to touch on this very, very briefly. Um, but we can start to view the body as an ecological entity. Um, uh, and this, this goes whether it's um, de decomposing above ground or below ground. And one of the most fruitful areas of investigation, particularly in terms of PMI estimation that's taking place now, is looking at the interaction between bacteria and fungi um, and um, the body, um, not just in the early post-mortem period, but right through to advanced skeletonization. So I'll give you an idea here, these are histological cross-sections, and these are, uh, if memory serves, um, at least three decades old, if not older. And what you're looking at on the top slide here is alteration to the microstructure of bone by bacteria, um, what we call um, areas of um, budding or, or, or focused um, destruction, and then the interaction with um, fungi, uh, something called vedal tunneling um, uh, through bone. And for a long time, we were uh, quite hamstrung in the fact that these are slow processes and to cause these physical histological changes takes a very long period of time. And it wasn't very well related to post-mortem mental estimation. And then in the last um, decade, there's been the realization that the microbiome, so the bacterial biome that's on our skin, that's in the soil around us, um, inside our gut, um, can be used to, to track the change and that can be used to track post-mortem mental estimation and to understand uh, the shift between the um, anaerobic components and the decomposition and then the environmental aerobic components of bacteria as they then go um, uh, through to uh, colonize the body. This is work here for Jessica Metcalf, which was published a couple of years ago, which used um, next-gen sequencing techniques to look at the, the change in uh, bacterial community uh, presence, um, so the, the relative abundance of different uh, bacteria as it shifts from one that's inherent to the body to one that's inherent in the soil and looking at that in terms of the estimation of time. Um, and for those of you who are interested, um, I can provide references for these. It's a, it's a fascinating, highly developed area of omic research in terms of taphonomy. Um, but the burial environment itself, 
other leaves us other signatures, um, and these are highly interrelated, highly correlated with each other, um, and it depends on the nature of the soil, the depth of the burial, um, and other physical processes such as temperature and water. And this can include things like acid corrosion, so in, in sandy or highly acidic soils, the destruction of bone minerals, and these, the presence of these of windowing, and these are processes which leave a unique series of telltale signatures. Root etching, so the effects of humic acid in, um, in roots, plant roots, as they migrate and tunnel and encapsulate bodies, they leave particular um, significant markers. Mineral deposition, this is a um, presence of a, an org, um, a mineral called vivianite, um, but it could be iron-rich, um, uh, iron oxide, it could be manganese and various other compounds, some of which can help preserve um, forensic trace evidence, some of which can help destroy it, depending on the nature of the, um, of the mineral being deposited. The soil itself and the depth over which a body is deposited can create uh, very significant problems in terms of the preservation of things like DNA and just even a basic bone itself. So this is what happens when a body is placed in a grave, buried um, uh, at considerable depth, and then um, uh, heavy, in, in this case here, a, a cement concrete brick structure is placed over the body. Um, it's rendered down to, um, to be very, very friable, um, making anthropological recovery um, and any forensic trace recovery almost impossible. And that's, um, that's caused by, by several tons of matrix pressure um, destroying the bone in conjunction with other things such as um, soil pH and water levels. Um, but even a body that's contained in a coffin um, can, uh, as it decomposes, wear in a particular way that tells us something meaningful about the burial environments. So this is a process called coffin wear, which is very often found um, under um, uh, things like this, this is the, the femoral head here. Um, this, these would be the, um, the tuberosities, which you, you can feel at your, um, in the base of your buttocks. And basically that's a form of mechanical and chemical wear that takes place um, when a body is resting on a hard surface. Um, so it tells us something about positioning the body and if it's been moved um, prior to, to recovery. So all of these give us very particular signatures that say something about the, uh, the process of survival of the body um, and allow us to reconstruct a narrative that will stand up in court. Um, but we need to explain all the evidence at hand. So for instance, this here is a, um, uh, a fetus um, a young, um, young individual, and uh, we've got preservation of things like um, uh, hand and foot bones, we've got preservation of bones of the skull and of the thorax, we've also got preservation of soft tissue. Um, in this case here it's keratin, it's hair, um, uh, at, the, um, at the head of, the, um, of the, the infant. And you know, again going back to, to uh, Bob, um, uh, Bob Mann and, um, and Bill Bass, um, this Preservation of organic remains like this would lead this to be suspect uh, potential forensic case. Um, but in this instance here, the presence of copper pins um, at and around the head is a, it's an archeological case and this is a shroud burial, um, have created a locally toxic environment that's preserved the soft tissues. So understanding the taphonomy allows us to, to effectively um, understand why we get um, uh, advanced preservation of some components and not others. The coffin itself plays a big part in this, um, and particularly in, in sealed coffins, which this is a much more um, common um, issue these days in terms of uh, modern mortuary practices, where um, an aer aerobic um, environment is excluded. So we get anaerobic decomposition, and we very often get the formation of a process called saponification, where um, subcutaneous fat um, is chemically altered um, into a, a form of, um, of soap, which preserves soft tissue, including integument, but also um, muscle and internal organs. Um, so the extremes of preservation caused by sealing oxygen out um, from the burial environment. Um, and then we've got other factors which need to take into account. So things like uh, what happens when a body is exposed on the surface, so sub, what we call sub aerial weathering. And this is basically um, akin to uh, fatigue um, drying um, on uh, paint on the outside of a house. So it's caused by repeated exposure to sun and to drying. And it's used in an estimation of post-mortem interval for bodies that are exposed on the surface, except for it's just not terribly good. Um, and it was originally developed for um, process of understanding um, bodies in um, East African environments, particularly ungulates, comes from paleo paleobiology and ecology. And it's been very, very poorly applied to, to human taphonomy. So this is one of these areas that, that personally I would like to see done away with. Um, it's meaningful only in the sense it tells us that, that remains were exposed on a surface. 
um, and eventually they skeletally uh, fall apart. Um, but there is very little um, association between post-mortem interval est estimation or PMI um, and the state of those remains because there are so many conflicting factors that take place um, as that body is decomposing or that skeleton is decomposing. And recent work by James McInnes and colleagues has demonstrated that you can mimic weathering through other processes, particularly by, in a dark environment, wetting bone and then drying it, and then wetting it and drying it and wetting it and drying it. Um, and it causes the same process. So um, weathering is one of those, those issues that, um, that um, some of us consider to be um, uh, quite a personal bugbear. Um, it's also compounded by the fact that um, the human body, when we're looking at uh, many of these processes, uh, the human body weathers and degrades, its bone degrades in a different way from animal bone because of, of um, fundamental notions in terms of uh, the nature of our bone structure, our cellular structure, compared to what we find in things like pigs and cows um, and sheep, etc. Um, and there's an awful lot we don't know in terms of um, how bodies um, degrade or decompose in different environments. So we don't know about um, deciduous forests, for instance, we're, we're, we're very poor understandings about savanna environments, tundra, caves, etc. So there's lots of areas for, um, for uh, expansion of research. Um, uh, insects aren't the only things to predate on the body, so they're one of the primary drivers of decomposition, but um, they are not one of the primary drivers of dispersal of remains. So tophonomy can look at uh, the interaction between um, osteophagues and carnivores um, on human bodies and, and um, other carcasses. So for instance, here, there, um, we look some members of the carnivore guild here, such as bears, hyenas, lions, etc., cetera, uh, jackals and wolves. Um, but in forensic situations, this, this also incorporates things like small carnivores. So um, foxes, mustelids, weasels, stoats, etc., all of whom have the capacity to, um, through the use of their dentition, um, and this varies um, in terms of the power from um, things like domestic dogs down here and, and humans right through to things like alligators and sharks and specialist carnivores can cause massive amounts of damage to, to the skeleton. And they remove not just soft tissue, but hard tissue as well. But they leave recognizable characteristic traces um, such as scalloping, pitting, uh, tooth marks um, as they work their way down through, through carcasses. And that tells us something fundamental about um, about uh, how a body um, um, has been effectively taken apart uh, uh, in the post-mortem um, uh, period. Um, but it's not just carnivores that do this as well. So we also get um, other animals which are osteophagus. So they, they chew bone for the minerals. So that includes things like pigs, warthogs, even a giraffe here, um, sheep, and they cause um, their own unique pattern of damage. Uh, birds do as well. So um, avian damage, obviously things like eagles and, and vultures are um, highly efficient uh, avian predators, but it also includes things like um, um, house sparrows and crows um, and others, and they leave recognizable, um, definable characteristics on the body as well. As do rodents, so things like rats and mice, um, squirrels, porcupines, um, uh, dassies, um, so rock hyrax and various other things will leave um, recognizable traces on, on bone as they use these hard tissues, both for the mineral content, but also as a way of, of sharpening um, and uh, wearing their uh, continuously growing incisors. Um, and again, there's been uh, attempts to, to characterize this. Again, James McInnes, who's a very prolific in this area, um, looking at the, the pattern of damage that's left on bone and measuring it as an indication of what the agent of, um, of uh, bone damage actually was. So you can see here um, uh, differences between mice, rats, um, and if you want to take it to its logical extreme, then you can look at the, the big damage caused by things like porcupines. Um, but other um, vectors um, also cause damage to, um, to uh, the body. And it's not just, um, it's not just uh, carnivores, it's not just insects um, affecting the soft tissues, they can do it to the hard tissues as well. So what you're looking at here, is termite alteration of a skeleton where the, the, um, the vertebral column has actually been restructured um, and um, uh, remodeled uh, biochemically to act as uh, a brood chamber for a termite mound that was, that was based over the, um, uh, over the body. Um, but even things like snails, um, termites, uh, beetles, etc., uh, can cause quite significant and uh, in some cases forensically highly relevant damage to the skeleton. 
And you might think that, um, that snails um, are very cute um, uh, little creatures, um, but what you're looking at here are the radulae or the, the, um, uh, the sclera, which form the, um, these rows of hard mineralized tissues around the mouth of, or, or the, the mouth of foot part are of a snail. And that can cause significant damage to those of you in the garden. We realize that they like um, leafy green vegetables and they like the things that you're growing, but they can also cause damage to much harder structures as well, whether that's wood, um, in the case of termites or boring beetles um, or bone. Um, and these are some of the, of the patterns of damage that we might, we, we can see on skeletons caused by things like giant land snails. This is Acatina here. Garden snails, uh, land snails again, high beetles, um, domestic beetles, uh, both in the larval stage and the adult stage. And these are quite significant alterations to the structure of the skeleton. And that creates a significant problem when we actually use insects to macerate or to remove soft tissue um, from forensic um, specimens. So we very often, we certainly continue to do it for um, animal specimens for use in teaching. We we'll use domestic beetles, but where these beetles are being used as a way of removing soft tissue over things like um, areas of trauma, rather than macerating using cooking of, of bone, then you can actually be introducing problems or damage into the, um, into the forensic process, um, which can be very, very hard to explain away um, in court. Right, so I'm gonna wrap this up now. Um, what I've, I've basically given you is, is a whistle-stop tour through um, just some of the areas that we now classify as forensic taphonomy. So we've talked about um, PMI, we've talked a little bit about deposition, but not, not um, in any great depth. One of the things that we have mentioned um, uh, only in passing is the role of intervention. In some respects, that's one of the, the next most um, uh, experimentally um, uh, exciting area of forensic research and forensic practice. Um, and I'm more than happy to come back at a later date and talk about that as a, a separate subject. Um, but to wrap up, how does taphonomy help the court? Well, I hope I've given you some idea today of some of the things that it can do. It's a vast subject area, but it allows us to improve search and location skills and recovery skills, particularly in relation to things like forensic archaeology. Um, dealing with particular human facilities, um, it builds resilience in first responders. So you can train law enforcement, the police, forensic archaeologists to go and excavate remains of decomposing um, humans in controlled environment and then debrief them afterwards. So it, can, it can guard against things like PTSD, for instance. Um, it allows a long time scale development uh, of PMI estimation. So it builds uh, longer estimations of time since death than the traditional mortem triad. It allows us to build post-mortem narratives to understand all the multiple things that can take place in and around and on a body as it goes from being a living, breathing organism to having died, to being recovered. And it definitely allows us to improve methods of identification because we can take into account biases that affect them. So it affects anthropology, DNA, latent prints, et cetera. And it allows us to assess lots of different vectors and how they interact with each other, both natural processes, cultural processes, um, and particularly as we didn't touch on today, um, things like the effects of trauma. So and it's come an awful long way from the initial stages um, of the work that, that Bill Bass um, undertook with colleagues back in the 1970s. Final slide. For those of you who are interested in taphonomy, there is a, a very specialist and extensive literature, um, and there is specialized training available. Um, the, the literature very often is geared around seminal core textbooks, um, uh, but it's found across a variety of not just forensic um, journals, but also um, biological anthropology, evolutionary, anthropology, archaeology, etc. And I haven't been doing this now for the best part of 30 years. One thing I've come to the conclusion is that we actually, what we don't know in taphonomy is at this point far greater than what we do know. So those of you who are interested in, um, in research or in developing research projects um, uh, as practitioners or students, taphonomy is an area that is ripe for scientific experimentation and publication. Um, it's an ongoing, dynamic, um, evolving discipline. Um, and with that, I'm going to leave it there. Um, if anybody got any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to address those now. And I've gone fractionally over time. Um, but um, if anybody does have any, uh, wants to take this up further, um, there's my email address and feel absolutely free um, to contact me and 
uh, we can uh, have a discussion offline. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful session. Now, uh, I would request all the participants to just write their query in the chat box, or if they want to ask directly to the sir, they can raise their hand. So there is one question that uh, they want to ask about the opportunities, career opportunities in the subject. Okay. Um, right. Well, I mean, uh, I would say career opportunities in, for, in forensic taphonomy are... Uh, go hand in hand with career opportunities in any other area of forensic science. So um, I think it depends largely whether or not um, uh, an, individu an individual is interested purely in human taphonomy in the sense of decomposition and um, uh, the postmodern processes or in other areas. I mean, uh, in essence, taphonomy also um, impacts things like preservation of, of other trace evidence at crime scenes. So um, and there's been some really um, some fascinating work that's been done of late. My own institution, um, Kelly Sheridan and uh, Ray Palmer um, and Matteo um, Galadbiano um, published this week a paper on the um, transfer of uh, textile fibers without contact um, using experimental modeling. And that basically is a, is a taphonomic process. Um, uh, other people are looking at things like taphonomy of, of latent prints, survival of DNA, etc. So it's, there are immense um, employment opportunities in taphonomy. It's not just about burial environments and about, um, about post-mortem mental estimation. Um, the, the major centers for taphonomic research um, and training is University of Tennessee. Um, it's the University of Sydney um, in Australia, um, University of Central Lancashire in, in the UK, uh, Teesside, um, uh, Cranfield, Northumbria, um, University of Amsterdam. I mean, there, there are lots and lots of opportunities um, in, in research. The one thing I will say is that training in forensic taphonomy opens up the potential for um, uh, transferable skills into other areas of taphonomy. So half of my time is working on forensic related matters, but the rest of my time is, is involved in archaeology and paleontology, um, applying the forensic um, core skills back into deeper time and that's that's led to some fantastic collaborations and major publications so I mean in essence what I would I would like to say is that um, that uh, taphonomy uh, isn't a niche discipline it's actually central um, to um, uh, central to uh, forensic science uh, employability has potential to go much much further than um, uh, further than uh, just the discipline itself. Um, I can see one question here. Um, have there been occasions when forensic taphonomists have testified in court? That's a very good question. Um, and my honest answer is, I don't know. It's a conversation I was having with, um, with uh, David Erickson at, from Cranfield and uh, Mike Crun from the Netherlands Forensic Institute, is that um, what you've got uh, very often, particularly in, in the UK court system, is that forensic archaeologists, for instance, um, don't tend to testify in court. Um, their, their expert witness reports are accepted as um, uh, de facto evidence and they don't tend to be cross-examined. To follow me very often falls into that, that category. Um, so a forensic pathologist may well be, be asked information about, um, about early PMI um, but because the taphonomy very often is, in, is incorporated into, um, into estimations of the archaeology, it very often is accepted. The, the only um, other uh, cases where taphonomists would testify in court um, would be around um, trauma. And a very large number of, of um, uh, taphonomists have testified to that effect. Um, if, you, if you look at um, the United States, for instance, most of your uh, trauma active anthropologists or specialists in trauma will have given evidence in court on that basis and they are acting as taphonomists in court. If you look at any of Steve, um, Steve Symes's publications, they're very often based on his casework. Um, so, I mean, I'm more than happy to put together a kind of a reading list for this, um, uh, for Janita to, um, to distribute to this, this group. And that would also incorporate things like, um, next question here on hands-on practical experience courses, workshops. Um, yes, I, I, can, I can provide you links with those. Uh, we'll be having one at Northumbria, um, hopefully next year, 
um, around standards in forensic tophonomy um, uh, workshop subject to COVID um, and likely be around maybe next May or June. Um, uh, and yeah, let's say I'm happy to provide a, li a list of references and intervention points in um, or jumping in points for um, uh, forensic taphonomy. There's a question here from um, uh, Harry Joshi. Um, can I get some points on human intervention in forensic taphonomy? Again, um, I'm happy to provide you with um, some uh, core literature to start that off with. Um, probably the, the, the best single introduction to the discipline at the moment is a book called The Manual of Forensic Taphonomy by James McInnes, uh, which I would highly recommend um, those who are interested in it read. And that breaks everything down into its kind of core areas, including trauma analysis um, and, um, uh, and the rest. Now let's see. Uh, when body, body found, this is from Pratik Das. When a body is found in water after two or three days of death, then which point we have to look? Um, I don't know if it, whether you mean, does that mean uh, in terms of the placement of the body, its movement, or at what stage of decomposition would it be at? Um, again, bodies in water is a, um, is a, is a very specialized area. I mean, the, 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 the three people that I can think of who are uh, leading authorities on that um, is Lynn Bell in Canada, um, uh, Vivian Heaton, a Keel in uh, the UK, and a Geth Ribero at UCL in the UK. Um, and again, I'm happy to provide um, uh, publications on those or, or, or um, references for those, um, because the, the, the process of decomposition of body in water is um, as complicated, not more complicated from the process of decomposition on land, because it's affected by things like salinity, temperature, oxygenation levels in the water, the presence of scavengers and the rest. So um, there are, um, particularly Viv Heaton's work has indicated that there are kind of commonalities in terms of how you might body score. So the stages the body goes through in terms of decomposition in water is similar in a way to what happens on land, but you're removing the, the aerobic component from it. Um, and then uh, particularly in, in uh, situations of deep immersion, you can have rapid formation of adipocere as well, which complicates the process. But again, I'm happy to provide um, core references to allow you to, um, to look at that in a bit more detail. Uh, let's see, any more questions here? So there is one question that have there yeah. been occasions when forensic taphonomists have testified in court? Yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was one I... Would I yeah, that was the one that I um, I asked uh, addressed earlier on. So I mean, I think that that the 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 actually to, to follow on from that. So um, so yes, uh, in trauma, forensic taphonomists regularly um, uh, will testify in court. Um, but when it's in in terms of things like PMI estimation, less so. Um, and there's there's actually a, a confounding factor in this, which um, colleagues in the Netherlands have found is that because their court system is focused very heavily on uh, the application of Bayes statistical modeling in court. Forensic taphonomy is very often seen as, as not because it doesn't have um, large data sets of uh, conditional probabilities, so no posterior and prior probabilities um, with a lot of this data that it's actually not admissible in court. So that's something that, that um, needs to change that we need to be, to be developing larger statistical data sets that allow us um, to be able to apply things like Bayes modeling to PMI estimation and the rest. Um, uh, which would increase admissibility um, uh, and quality in court. Andrila um, uh, has raised her hand. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay. Uh, very good evening, everyone. I um, want to get access to the lecture note, please. Hello? Yes, you, you can. Uh, Are we get access to the lecture note, please? Can we get access? Hello, everyone. Can we get hello, host? Can we have access to the lecture notes, please? There is a disturbance. I think someone else is speaking. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't someone. catch any of that. Um, if you could type that, it'd be, it'd be really helpful. Yeah, you could type it for question. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question was, uh, what is the importance of uh, forensic psychology in uh, the field of taphonomy? Or maybe is taphonomy is also considered a part of forensic psychology? 
Uh, right. Okay. I, I, that's, that's a very good question. Um, um, we work, or rather, tophonomists do work with forensic psychologists. Um, so my colleague at uh, University of Central Lancashire, a guy called Peter Cross, um, has been working with um, with a forensic psychologist to look at um, the impact of death um, and uh, dealing with the death process um, as um, from point of view of uh, psychological impact and how you better can better cushion people against um, the the consequence of things like uh, dealing with cases of violent death. Um, uh, I know that there are colleagues in uh, police service in Northern Ireland who've taken a very um, strong uh, line on this um, and in other areas of, of forensic practice where we're dealing with violent death. I mean, it, it is one of these things that you can never you can never train somebody um, to how to deal with violent death or the consequences, particularly you know, of, of um, dealing with advanced decomposition, the sights, the smells, the textures and everything else. Um, but um, uh, by working with forensic psychologists, we're starting now to develop methods uh, of training that can mitigate some of those, those effects. Um, and again, if, if, you, if you want to contact me afterwards, um, I can pass you on Peter's contact details. He's actually publishing some work later on this year on that and has given a couple of um, um, conference presentations on it. Uh, but there's, a, there's a, a lot of interest in the interaction between taphonomic practice, particularly at human facilities and forensic psychology, because it plays such an important part um, in how we deal with first responders and other forensic scientists at body scenes. Uh, so, sir, so Patrick, do I need to email you on the email ID that you have yeah, provided? Yeah, just, just drop me a quick email and I'll um, put you in touch with Peter. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. And somebody else has asked here, do you see the creation of Body Farm as a joint project among yes. the universities? Yeah. Um, right. For those of you who are not familiar, we, we have a piece of legislation called the Human Tissue Act. Um, uh, uh, which falls under the Human Tissue Authority, which means biomedical ex experimentation is very difficult on human tissue in the UK. Um, uh, but um, all I can say is that there are discussions and processes afoot um, that uh, are, is moving towards the creation of a UK facility. Um, but it's, um, it's, it would be a model rather different from what we find elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, but the, yeah, there, is, there is movement taking place, there are discussions, um, but I think it might, might still be another decade before we have a UK-based facility. One of the things that, that I think those of us who work in the UK are doing is we're making um, everything we possibly can um, do with animals count so that the human data and the animal-based data are um, comparable. Um, and where they're not comparable, then we, you know, we, we just don't share that science. Um, so there's a lot of work going on about things like um, network development, about um, composition of large, or, or compiling large data sets from different facilities so that you can use both human-based data, animal-based data, um, but combine your sample sizes. So doing experiments in a much more clever joined up way um, which gets around some of the problems we face in um, human facilities where your sample sizes are quite small because you're relying on, do on body donations um, and you, you, know, you can't guarantee when people are going to be available to, to incorporate into your facilities. So it's, it's, um, we're starting to do things a lot more sensibly now. Um, we're starting to do things a lot more in a much more joined up fashion. Um, and I think if, if those of you are interested in this, keep an eye out next year for uh, the workshops that we'll have at Northumbria. I'll, um, I will um, uh, put it out on social media close to the time. Um, obviously with COVID and everything else, um, uh, some of it may be in person, some of it may not, but we probably try and make as much of it available online so that people like yourselves can engage in that process. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, good evening everyone. Uh, please host, can we have Access to the lecture notes, please. Lecture notes. I, I can I can provide you with a, with um, with um, some supportive. Yeah, I, I can provide you with the slides, and I'll actually provide you with a, a review article which deals with with um, 
uh, different aspects of forensic taphonomy as well. I'll, I'll, I'll provide some publications of, of, of that I'm, I'm free to share. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, any other participant has any question? Or you can directly email him also. He has provided so you with the email. Is he speaking? No writing in the chat box. If you have any query, you can ask directly to the sir. Yeah. So you can write on the chat box also. Okay. I I have write it in the chat box, but. Uh, I I asked to the prof. Uh, thank you for the for your lesson, and I am a PhD student in vertebrate paleontology and taphonomy. Ah, okay, excellent. Uh, Where are you studying? In a Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre. Okay. Uh, congratulations for the lesson. Very interesting. Thank you. I have a question about the the pig examples. Né? Yeah. In the in the figures uh, number three. Yeah. Uh, active decay. Yeah. The, uh, the figure uh, shows the um, a dark area around the carcass. Yeah. Okay. Uh, was uh, investigated the pH uh, pH modification in the soil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, how strong is this modification? Because um, for me, it's, it's very interesting uh, about the uh, fossil diagenesis. Yeah, it's it's you get a you get a, an, an increase in in acidification of the of that environment. Um, the, we, we've we've had a whole series of student projects over over the last ten years that have looked at different areas of these um, using the traces facilities. So we, I can I can um, I can provide you with um, with copies of those. Um, the uh, so what you get is this exudate um, that um, uh, either through um, uh, through purging from the orifices um, or if there are there are um, skin splits or um, uh, any wounding, um, but you start to get this um, this migration of exudate, which is is um, very heavily um, if memory serves. Um, uh, focused on sulfur-based compounds. You get lots of um, cholesterol. Um, uh, there are water-soluble components that, that come out in this, as well as um, um, uh, components that bind very readily to, um, uh, to soil structures. Um, you know, a number of, the, um, a number of the, um, the exudates that are produced are um, uh, bind rapidly to things like clay, uh, clay molecules. Particularly the um, the the hydro um, uh, hydrophobic component of um, of, of clay molecules, um, so it, it increases the um, the pH, um, uh, and then I mean, in essence begins to migrate out into the surrounding soil environment. And we we don't really fully understand um, the the pattern and tempo of what's happening with that because it's, it's so dependent on um, on soil chemistry, uh, but more importantly, it's dependent on the, the subsurface hydrology. Um, so how water, particularly rainwater, moves down through the soil, how it interacts with, um, with um, surface plant cover, and then migrates down and out um, underneath the body. So you've got um, a vertical transmission going straight down into the, um, into the, the subsoil, and you've got lateral transmission as well. Um, particularly um, where those pigs were, were placed, some of them are on um, slight slopes. What you also get then is a um, is a downslope movement um, on the surface as well as within the um, the structure of the soil as well. But again, I can, I'm happy to send you um, copies of some of the dissertations that deal with this, um, and that will give you some of the, uh, the, the the raw data to have a look at. Okay, thank you, thank you, Professor. Yeah, if you drop if you drop me an email, I'll, I'll send you those. I'm sorry for my English, very poor. <laughs> no, no, your English is great. Okay, now I think we're done with our question answer rounds. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful session. You have enlightened us with uh, your knowledge. Although we are in virtual space, uh, 
I would like request to sir you to accept the certificate of appreciation. Thank you very much. I think it's visible on screen. <laughs> it is indeed. Uh, okay. Uh, on behalf of S Sherlock Institute of Forensic Science, I would like to thank all the dedicated members and the volunteers who are working very hard to make this session successful and would like to present certificate to them also. Thank you, Afreen, Amala, Amberdon, Anmol, Pooja, Palak, Kaneri, Kratika, Laksh, Vashik, Lashika, Mabel, Neha, Nemesha, Pallavi, Priya, Rajvignesh, Shruchika, Shiza, Shivani, Tahir, Tanya, Vashnavi. So you can see we are a very big team which are working on this <laughs> international series. Now, all the registered participants can download the certificate from this website, which is www.forensicimates.com slash download certificate. Uh, in this, you when you will open this website, in the right top corner, you will see option download certificate. And then down here, you can just uh, write your registered email ID. And then all the certificates will be uh, available, available, which uh, you have attended the webinar. And the certificate looked like this. And I also would like to um, invite you all for the first international um, biannual symposium of uh, Association Forensic Odontology for Human Rights, which will be happening in September 21. Excellent. Okay. Uh, with this, I would like to, uh, to request Patrick sir, to give a concluding uh, statement. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, there's. Um, I'm going to share my, my screen again uh, briefly so you can see my email address. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming along to the talk. Um, it was my pleasure to give it. Um, I, I'm, I'm Those of you who know me, um, and um, um, hi Emma, uh, will know that I'm extremely passionate about, about um, taphonomy and, and what we do. But I think that, that um, hopefully today I've given you an indication of just what an impact um, uh, having appreciation, if, if not specialization of, of taphonomy can do for forensic science. Um, there are serious discussions at the moment that um, I have with the colleagues, which hopefully we'll have in print um, next year, which is actually looking at some of the, the epistemological and theoretical basis of actually how forensic science operates. Um, so why we do the things we do, how we um, uh, arrive at our interpretations, our hypotheses, and how we test them. Um, and it's very interesting that, that um, a core part of that discussion is focusing around the role of taphonomy in all of this. So it, I think it's a, it's a discipline that has an immense amount of potential. Um, it has in making an enormous impact on certainly forensic anthropology and archaeology, but I think other areas of um, uh, postmodern science and uh, forensic science as well. So hopefully today's lecture has given you just a smidgen of um, some of the areas of interest and what can be done with them. Um, and as I say, I'm more than happy to continue this conversation um, offline. There's my email address. Um, all of you stay well um, and stay safe. And um, I'll hopefully see you again at one of these events in the future. Thank you very much. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. No, thank you. With this, I would like to conclude our session of today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, all the participants, for participating in this session. Oh, ma'am. Oh, ma thank, thank Take you. Take care, everybody. Write the email ID for certification. Yeah, the email ID for the certificate. Uh, I'm just writing in the chat box. You can yeah, please take it from there.